with that, I would like to welcome you and we'll, we'll give you, turn it over to you with 15 minutes and then we will ask questions and go from there. So thank you. Okay. You can start right now. All right, whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, I'm Shanik. I'm Pranav. I'm John. And I'm Shiv, and we are No New Taxes Remastered. Good afternoon, judges. Uh, today we'll be discussing how we assist our clients from the Hernandez family with their financial situations. David and Gabriella are both 32. Daniel is currently working as a truck driver, and Gabriella is a hotel and room attendant. They also have two wonderful children, and David and Sophia. Although their parents don't know if they can finance their college, we are here to help them create a plan, not just for their children's college, but also their own financial future. So the NNT team always follows a five part process when advising its clients. First, we like to define our client's goals. Next, we take a look at their current state. This includes their assets, liabilities, and expenses. Then we try to make savvy recommendations for them to achieve their goals. Then we set a timeline for them to implement and execute these recommendations. Lastly, we like to monitor the results and give more insight and recommendations along the way. We also wanna make sure that our clients don't have to ignore their wants completely, but rather make smart financial decisions to ensure that they can achieve their goals. So now let's take a closer look into the Hernandez family's goals. So the Hernandez family has three main goals that they would like to achieve. First, they wanna pay off their debts. This includes their credit card and auto loan debt. Second, they wanna finance their children's education. And lastly, they would like to have a comfortable retirement and future. So now let's establish their current state. The combined, inc the combined net income for the couple is $52,500. One problem is that they don't have an emergency savings account. This could be harmful to the family, especially with times like now with COVID-19 where jobs like Gabriella's would not be in business. In terms of their liabilities, they have to pay back the car along with debts on two credit cards. One thing about all these debts is that they all have high interest rates in the 20s, which is terrible financial burden for anyone, especially for people that cannot pay back their debts in time. Along with this, they do not have health, health or life insurance, which in times like now would definitely be a need. And so before we, be, we can begin to con figure out how to consolidate the Hernandez family's debt and keep them on track for a successful financial future, we must talk about their expenditures and where exactly this money is going. One of the Hernandez family's largest annual expense is for their transportation. They have a high APR for their amortized payments and thus have a hefty payment to balance. Especially with the car's unreliability, Danielle and Gabriella have to worry a lot about additional payments on maintenance and repairs while also worrying about public transportation and gas. The next expense we have to discuss is their rental payments. Currently, they seem to be relatively well off on this expense and have not much to worry about in terms of rent. And for this category, we're glad to see that their landlord seems to be taking good care of them and being che on check with the maintenance. And so for the total costs, we counted for their monthly payments, utilities, and included rental insurance. As for the additional expenses, it seemed that the Hernandez family had a couple of expenditures to focus on. Although we weren't able to have an exact gauge on where exactly their money went, we counted for expenses such as food and entertainment, internet communications, which are staples to keeping the eyes of their young ones busy and happy, and banking fees, which could easily be fixed with financial security and trust in the banking system. With the understanding that their accounts are insured by the FDIC for up to $250,000, their funds will be secured. The Hernandez family also sends payments to their parents and our avid churchgoers, so we accounted for those expenses. And now with all this, we took the cumulative payments with the transportation, housing, and additional expenses to be around $31,000. And with their net income and expenses accounted for, they appeared to have around $21,000 left to spend. So now we will, we will be giving our recommendations to help the Hernandez family achieve their goals. So Gabriella and Daniel have a problem where they just don't, under, uh, don't trust banks or the concept of credit. Now this is completely understandable because from the case study, it is clear that they have been burned before with high interest rates, with credit cards and overdraft and other fees with their accounts. But it's really important for them to educate themselves because the truth is, while credit can be evil and burden those uh, for life, burden people for life, it is also a powerful tool that is necessary to build wealth and create a stable financial future. So we would advise Dan Daniel and Gabriella 
to use resources like local seminars or online courses to acquaint themselves with the concept of interest rates, credit, and how banks work. And with this newfound knowledge, hopefully Daniel and Gabriella could make new, better friends. You see, we think friends are supposed to help us and support us, but that's clearly not the case with Daniel and Gabriella's friends because they've been duped multiple times. Like in the case of the friend who gave them a ludicrously high 20% interest rate or on, on the car, or the friend who get charged them $600 to file their taxes when they could have done it online on sites like TurboTax for just under $50 or even free if they qualify. So with this, they have to change their lifestyle. It is clear from the case study that the Hernandez family doesn't trust banks and thus doesn't save any money. And this is a huge problem as living paycheck to paycheck makes them unable to save for their future goals and in a lot of cases makes them irresponsibly squander money like in the case of the $5,000 tax refund, where they were thinking, let's just spend it on clothes and a TV and new sofas. We will advise them to develop a budget and save money that they will have left over in an emergency saving fund, 529 plans for their kids, a Roth IRA and a 401k with these priorities in order. So in terms of um, citizenship, Dan Daniel and Gabriella have let us know that they're currently on a working visa. However, we recommend that they apply for a green card as soon as possible. And once they receive this in a few years, they apply for citizenship as well. So the perks of having citizenship for them would be that they would qualify for social security at retirement and their children will be naturalized citizens. Um, the couple have debts to pay back with their credit card company and their car loan. We suggest that the couple pays, pay off their debts immediately because of the extremely high APR associated with these debts. After paying these debts, uh, the couple can focus on building wealth in their family's future. And there's no reason at all for uh, consolidating these debts or having even more debt because as you can see, they have $21,000 every year that they can spend on other things that other than necessities. And that's where this money to pay off these debts immediately would come from. So in terms of insurance, we recommend that they buy uh, first to die term life insurance, since at this point, they don't have many assets and, um, and they have two dependents to take care of. So if something were to happen to Danielle or Gabriella, the rest of the family would be left in a terrible financial situa situation. For this reason, we also recommend that they take the health insurance plan from Daniel's employer as soon as possible. And so the next thing we want to emphasize is the Hernandez family's emergency fund. Currently, they have only a bit saved up in Mexico, but we advise them to save much more. The golden standard of saving is having six months of the family's expenses prepared in case of emergency. Especially in this time of crisis, we can see how crucial it is to have these funds saved up. And this would account to be about $15,000 saved, which may seem like a lot, but is very important, especially with the family's current state somewhat in the wind. Another important aspect of the Hernandez family's future is David and Sophia's future education. We believe that investing in the children's future education, as Danielle and Gabriella have emphasized, is an important priority to set straight. But in order for this to take place, as we mentioned, we want to make sure that all the family's debts are consolidated and straightened out. The plan for the educational preparation for Danielle and Gabriella is to open up two 529 plans and contribute as much as they can towards it, which would be around $40,000 to cover the minimums for room and board. We also strongly emphasize that the family utilize any financial aid from the FAFSA and scholarship programs available. Many scholarship programs such as QuestBridge, QuestBridge, which I have utilized, can help financially disadvantaged students receive fantastic aid to top universities. After all, there are billions of dollars in untapped scholarships available for all students. There are also ones that cater specifically to David and Sophia's socioeconomic status. Instead of buying a house in Mexico, we think that it's better for them to settle down here in Miami. So we found a house using a $200,000 budget that has three bedrooms and three bathrooms, which would suit their living style now as they live in a three bed, three bathroom place right so, now. So the $40,000 down payment is going to be something they're going to have to save up for. And that's going to be uh, later in time. And we don't know when. It depends on what, how their financial situation progresses as time goes on. So that's why we're not putting in a monthly payment on the house because we don't know what the interest rate will be at that time. So saving for retirement. Currently, this is their fourth priority after creating an emergency savings plan and a 529 plan for their kids because of the fact that, uh, because of the fact that they have shown in the case study that they really value their kids' education and they want their kids to have a better future and a better lifestyle than they do. So uh, for this reason, we're going to uh, ask them to invest money as much as they can 
after spending all the other expenses and the emergency savings plan into a Roth IRA. And they can contribute uh, up to $12,000. And the reason that they're not going to use the 401k, uh, uh, Daniel's employer does offer a 401k, but the problem is right now they don't, they're in a pretty low tax bracket. So their tax uh, burden isn't going to be very high. So it's not going to save much in the 401k and there's no kind of match. Roth IRA, on the other hand, they'll have to pay a small amount of tax right now because of the low uh, uh, tax bracket that they're in. But all of those savings over time for the next 30 years until they retire is, are going to go up tax-free. Same with the 529. The 529 isn't very useful if they do it like 10 years in the future because that uh, post-tax uh, and that tax-deferred de uh, um, uh, interest that the account uh, accumulates isn't going to be very valuable if it's only in that, in that account for a couple of years. So if the employer starts matching or uh, if Daniel gets a new employer or if they start making more money in the higher tax bracket, they should reconsider this and might prioritize the 401k. So now let's take a look at how we plan on implementing and executing our plan. So number one, we're going to pay off those debts. And it's really not that high of an amount of debt. There's much people, they don't have any student loans. They don't, even, they don't even have a house. They don't have any kind of mortgage. They have nothing. They just have that about... $3,500 to $4,000 worth of debt. And it's at an incredibly high interest rate, both the car and the credit card. So that, and then this next paycheck and the next paychecks that come, all the ex extra money has to go down in, in to immediately get rid of that debt. Second, we want, uh, their priorities are that they want to ensure a stable and a good education for their kids. And that means that establishing a 529 plan for the minimum room and board that they'll have to pay as well as, uh, in, in, and as well as save more money in case that the uh, financial aid and scholarships don't cover all the tuition. And then we want them to start to build wealth for a stable future. And that uh, means uh, paying for retirement in their Roth IRA and their 401k. We also want them at the same time to be saving for the $40,000 about for a down payment for a house so that they can stop paying rent and start actually building equity in a house and also improving credit. And we want them to retire comfortably after all of this. And not and have to and be able to uh, accomplish that goal where um, uh, one of them only wants to work part time at age 50, and we think that should be Gabriella because she's making much less, so uh, they'll still be able to have a stable income if she works part time. Okay, so now we will discuss how we plan to monitor their results. And so, for the final step of our NNT financial advising is to maintain a semi annual checkup for the family. During this, we want to make sure that the Hernandez family is on track and can actually manage their planned out schedule. In this process, we can adjust the recommendations to better cater to their needs while also enabling them to figure out ways to accomplish their secondary goals, some of which include finally being able to buy new clothes for the children, enjoying the luxuries of a new TV, providing financial support for the family, and maintaining good health by spending more on leisure activities. We believe that spending additional funds on whatever they want could actually support their mental health and help them to live a healthy life in the future. So in terms of the Hernandez's future plans, we suggest for them to establish a living trust with each other because it is fairly cheap. It, it is a fairly cheap one-time payment. This allows for one of them to receive custody of the other's assets if something were to happen. So now here's the bottom line. With our plan, we have put them on the right track to achieve their goals of paying off their debts, funding their children's education, and retiring comfortably. Thank you. Thank you, nice job. Um, okay, so now your voice is breaking a bit. And I'm going to turn it over to Heather to ask the first question. Thank you. Um, so great presentation. My, my first, my question was, um, can you comment on the trade-offs be between uh, paying and saving for their uh, children's college education and saving for their own retirement? How did you uh, come up with those recommendations of okay. how much to save? So it was purely from the case study. Uh, in terms of what their priorities align. They uh, really thought that was important in the case study that they wanted to ensure uh, good education for their kids. They didn't want student loans at all. They were really against that. And we think it's important for them to keep that in mind. And the thing with 529 plans is that as, if you don't keep the money in that plan for a really long time, it doesn't really have any tax advantage. So we're going to say, first, put the money in the 529 and let it stay, right? If you can, put maybe $5,000 a year and um, for the next eight years, and you've got 40,000 one for one of the kids, and that's going to grow too. So that's the reason that we said, first, let's do the 529, and then, um, then let's look it up, because they're also relatively young. They're only uh, 30. So 
of course, it's better, you know, the power of compounding to have retirement early, but they also have a lot of other problems that they want to take care of. So we're going to tell them to worry about the education first. Thank you. So um, I'll ask the next, next question. I you guys could go back to the beginning. Could you tell me how you excess income minus their expenses really quickly? Because I was having trouble following the to the first part of it. Oh yeah. So the first couple okay, slides. So how did you get? Oh, sorry. Um, the ahead. first couple slides are about the expenses, and so um, if we can move the slide show up. Yeah, so, so yeah, uh, we begin with the, the transportation costs, which were listed, and we also accounted for like gas payments and maintenance, as well as um, other things. And then we went to housing and then get, got that total additional expenses total. And then we put that into a whole category of total expenses. Yeah. So, so we like, looked at annual, just to yeah, show this expense. is the best way to show that they have all this money left over. And the fact that they're living paycheck to paycheck, not putting it in the bank is it's obviously a lot of money is going wasted and that has to change. So quick question. Did you take into consideration Gabriel's work situation and her opportunity to work for her sister? Um, uh, sorry, do you want to go, Sean? You, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, we actually, yeah, we did could take that into consideration. And so when we're giving these values, it's actually a range. And so we've, um, we made a baseline of what exactly the expenditures will be. And then depending on the income and how much they'll have left, we'll able to uh, be able to manage the whole funds and uh, stuff. So we, yeah, we took that into consideration and um, wanted to make sure that everything was accounted for. And so we made sure to have like a general idea of what we're going to use, but it's not for sure. And so, yeah. Yeah. but not necessarily rec rec recommending that she start working for her sister to earn side income. Uh in, well, in, yeah. the case study, in the case study, it stated that uh, Gabriel's, Gabriela's sister would um, pay her hundred dollars to clean her house for her um, if she needed the money. But yeah. we're trying to make it so that she doesn't even need that money. And if she wants to work part time, then she has the option to do so. She and she and uh, that's completely her. And and that sometimes might be a good idea because you know if it's her sister, this probably it's kind of tax free. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So, yeah. <laughs> All cash. Okay. Okay. Nate, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, nice job, guys. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you were advising as it relates to credit and credit score and how that leads into their future goals for, say, buying a house or things along yeah. those lines? Yeah. So for right now, they're probably relying on um, uh, da Daniel's credit score. He has a 680. That's kind of like a fair credit score. It's like kind of the minimum to get any kind of, uh, so it's still like a credit score that he can use to get a mortgage. It actually has to go up and that's important. Um, if Gabriella, they can get their mortgage on his, uh, his name so they can use that credit score and Gabriella doesn't have any credit. So she should do something like join a credit union, something like that to build some credit up. But um, in terms of that credit score, they haven't been using credit, they've been using credit cards, but they haven't been putting money in the bank. They don't have a net worth, their net worth is negative. So if they follow our recommendations, start saving money, establish that trust in banks, put their money in banks, uh, start contributing to their 401k, all the stuff with the credit score will automatically go up and they'll be in the position to uh, get a mortgage on a house and, and really have a future. Um, Tony, did you have a question? Um, yes. <clears throat> First of all, good presentation and a really good suggestion about getting citizenship to be able to qualify for Social Security and that type of thing. That's really good. Um, my question was more, uh, can you explain the recommendation for the living trust again? Yeah, well, yeah, this is just like kind of a, um, anybody should do it and every, and they currently immediately, they shouldn't do it. This is like a long-term recommendation. Time. Chance. Okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> awesome job, guys. Thank you so much. So, I believe job, guys. To transfer over to the awards. Welcome to the What to Expect at the National Personal Finance Challenge Overview video. I hope you find this helpful. I'm Jennifer Davidson. I am an economics professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and I'm also the president of the Nebraska Council on Economic Education. So I'm gonna talk through some basic instructions in the format of the competition. We'll look at the presentation and judging and the judging rubric. And then I'm gonna talk through 
a good example of what you can expect um, in, in terms of a presentation. So let's get started. Basic instructions and format of the event. Teams are provided a detailed family scenario. This is four pages long. Uh, it's based on real life. It generally is written uh, with the help of some certified financial planners and they are using their clients information and changing the names to make it really real world for students to have this opportunity to provide a financial plan for the family. So you're given this detailed family scenario. You have two hours to come up with a financial plan and prep for your presentation. You can use whatever software you're comfortable with, um, Google Slides, PowerPoint, or whatever. You're just gonna turn it in when it's time for you to do your presentation. Uh, in terms of supplies and curriculum, let's call it, you are allowed to use the internet to do some research during your two hours of work time. You can use calculators, you have access to scratch paper, but you may not use any personal finance textbooks or get assistance from anyone other than your teammates. As far as the presentation itself and the judging, you will have 15 minutes to present and then there will be a five minute question and answer period with the judges. It is important to know that teams are randomly assigned to judging rooms to present their plan. So there's four to five judges in each of the judging rooms. There's also four to five teams that are going to be in, in each of those judging rooms. So we have a group of judges and they're going to review four to five different presentations. Know that the judges are financial planners, they're bankers or they're other industry experts and they are required to unanimously select one team from each presentation room to advance to the finals. So they are, in their judging process, they are really trying to determine as teams enter, was this better than the previous presentation that we saw? And it's important that it's a unanimous decision from them. So at the finals then, if you are the team that is advancing from this particular presentation room, you will then repeat your presentation to a new panel of judges. As far as the judging rubric, 80%, 80%, the overwhelming percentage is on personal finance content that you displayed in your presentation. 10% is teamwork. It is important that all members of the team are participating in the presentation. And then the final 10% is on presentation, communication skills, including dress. So it is a professional competition. You are acting as financial planners. And so that's part of the criteria on the judging rubric. Just a note about judging. So judging is not a science. It can be subjective. So the, as I stated before, the judges are really comparing your presentation to others that they saw. This is why it is so important for you to know that you are randomly assigned to your judging room. All the teams are randomly assigned. And it's important to understand that we do require the, judge, the judges to come up with a unanimous decision on who to advance to the finals. So it may take them some time to talk through your presentation specifically. Um, and one judge may say, I think it's team X and another judge may say, I think it's team Y. And then they're gonna have to have a conversation and really explain, well, why do you think that way? And they're gonna have to get everybody to agree that it should be whichever team they decide to advance. So they're gonna talk through all of the different points that you've made during your presentation to determine, and really thinking back to their focus is on 80% content knowledge. That's really the biggest piece um, of your presentation. All right, so the scenario, as I mentioned, it is really detailed. It is very real life. There are many, many topics to address. In all reality, you may not be able to address them all in the time that you have. So you have two hours to work on them, and it may be the case that you can't get to all of them. Um, so you're going to need to think through that and maybe be strategic. So for example, the 2020 scenario had issues of employment, 
savings, insurance, investments, a, a distrust of the banking system, taxes, citizenship, and then goals around their children's education. So a successful team will be strategic in dividing up the workload probably by topic because you just don't have enough time to do the entire thing as a team together. So you're probably gonna need to divide and conquer to get through as much of the information as you can. The key is to showcase what you know. And my biggest tip here is to clearly and confidently provide your reasoning for the plan you are suggesting. That is the biggest thing. And I'm gonna to continue to hit on that point as we go through a critique of a successful team. So we're gonna take a look at the 2020 National Champs from Wilcox High in California. They presented as if a firm, so they, they created their own financial planning firm, and they did a very nice job of providing an overview of the, their financial planning process. So the NNT team always follows a five-part process when advising its clients. First, we like to define our clients' goals. Next, we take a look at their current state. This includes their assets, liabilities, and expenses. Then we try to make savvy recommendations for them to achieve their goals. Then we set a timeline for them to implement and execute these recommendations. Lastly, we like to monitor the results and give more insight and recommendations along the way. Pratt provided short overview of the family situation. What they did really well was talking through some of the problem areas during the overview. So you don't want to spend too much time on this as the judges have already read the scenario and they know the family details. So don't give up your presentation time to tell the judges what they already know. California did a great job here. The combined net income for the couple is $52,500. One problem is that they don't have an emergency savings account. This could be harmful to the family, especially with times like now with COVID-19, where jobs like Gabriella's would not be in business. In terms of their liabilities, they have to pay back the car along with debts on two credit cards. One thing about all these debts is that they all have high interest rates in the 20s, which is terrible financial burden for anyone, especially for people that cannot pay back their debts in time. Along with this, they do not have health, health or life insurance, which in times like now would definitely be a need. The team also completed a budget for the family. So some of these totals were given in the scenario and California filled in with realistic numbers to create the rest of the budget. The team talked through categories of expenses, including transportation, housing, additional expenses, and then provided a summary of income and expenses. This is important because you can't plan without a roadmap of where you are, a budget. This sets up the remainder of their financial plan. The Hernandez family also sends payments to their parents and our avid churchgoers, so we kind of for those expenses. And now with all this, we took the cumulative payments with the transportation, housing, and additional expenses to be around $31,000. With their net income and expenses accounted for, they appeared to have around $21,000 left to spend. They addressed issues head-on and succinctly. Banking and lack of savings was clearly an issue for the family. Here we hear Shanik accurately describe the issue and why it was a problem. So Gabriella and Daniel have a problem where they just don't, under, uh, don't trust banks or the concept of credit. Now this is completely understandable because from the case study, it is clear that they've been burned before with high interest rates, with credit cards and overdraft and other fees with their accounts. But it's really important for them to educate themselves because the truth is while credit can be evil and burden those uh, for life, burden people for life, it is also a powerful tool that is necessary to build wealth and create a stable financial future. Shiv and the team do a really nice job of explaining their reasoning behind suggestions for the family. The insurance section provides a good look at this. When 80% of judging is based on content knowledge, this is extremely important. And this is how you do well and showcase what you know. So in terms of insurance, we recommend that they buy uh, first to die term life insurance, since at this point they don't have many assets and, um, and they have two dependents to take care of. So if something were to happen to Danielle or Gabriella, the rest of the family would be left in a terrible financial situ situation. For this reason, we also recommend that they take the health insurance plan from Danielle's employer as soon as possible. Again, showcasing what they know and the reasoning behind their recommendations, Shanik talks through why they suggest a Roth IRA. This shows their understanding of paying the tax on the deposits to the account, which will then be tax-free at withdrawal. 
it also showed they knew that $6,000 each was the maximum they could contribute. We're going to uh, ask them to invest money as much as they can after spending all the other expenses and the emergency savings plan into a Roth IRA. And they can contribute uh, up to $12,000. And the reason that they're not going to use the 401k, uh, uh, Daniel's employer does offer a 401k, but the problem is right now they don't, they're in a pretty low tax bracket. So their tax uh, burden isn't going to be very high. So it's not going to save much in the 401k and there's no kind of match. Roth IRA, on the other hand, they'll have to pay a small amount of tax right now because of the low uh, uh, tax bracket that they're in. But all of those savings over time for the next 30 years until they retire is, are going to go up tax free. Same with the 529. The 529 isn't very useful if they do it like 10 years in the future because that uh, post-tax uh, and that tax de uh, deferred um, uh, interest that the account uh, accumulates isn't going to be very valuable if it's only in that, in that account for a couple of years. They have a great slide and overview where they share a timeline and give a summary. This shows an overall understanding of the entire financial plan and situation. Their nice slides also score points for presentation. Number one, we're going to pay off those debts. And it's really not that high of an amount of debt. There's a bunch of people, they don't have any student loans. They don't, even, they don't even have a house. They don't have any kind of mortgage. They have nothing. They just have that about $3,500 to $4,000 worth of debt. And it's at an incredibly high interest rate both the car and the credit card. So that, and then this next paycheck and the next paychecks that come, all the ex extra money has to go down in, in to immediately get rid of that debt. Second, we want, uh, their priorities are that they want to ensure a stable and a good education for their kids. And that means that establishing a 529 plan for the minimum room and board that they'll have to pay, as well as, uh, in, in, and as, well as save more money in case that the uh, financial aid and scholarships don't cover all the tuition. And then we want them to start to build wealth for a stable future. And that uh, means uh, paying for retirement in their Roth IRA and their 401k. We also want them at the same time to be saving for the $40,000 about for a down payment for a house so that they can stop paying rent and start actually building equity in a house and also improving credit. It's important to understand there's not always a right or wrong suggestion. What is really important is to justify the suggestions you're giving to the family. In the first question from the judges, Shonik does an excellent job in explaining their decision to recommend savings for the kids first and then for their retirement. Can you comment on the trade-offs be between uh, paying and saving for their uh, children's college education and saving for their own retirement? How did you uh, come up with those recommendations and okay. how much to save? So it was purely from the case study uh, in terms of what their priorities aligned. They uh, really thought that was important in the case study that they wanted to ensure uh, good education for their kids. They didn't want student loans at all. They were really against that. And we think it's important for them to keep that in mind. And the thing with 529 plans is that as, if you don't keep the money in that plan for a really long time, it doesn't really have any tax advantage. So we're going to say, first, put the money in the 529 and let it stay, right? If you can, put maybe $5,000 a year and um, for the next eight years, and you've got $40,000 one, for one of the kids. And that's going to grow too. So that's the reason that we said, first, let's do the 529 and then, um, then let's look it up because they're also relatively young. They're only uh, 30. So uh, of course, it's better, you know, the power of compounding to have retirement early, but they also have a lot of other problems that they want to take care of. So we're going to tell them to worry about the education first. Hopefully this has provided you a good overview of what to expect at the National Personal Finance Challenge. Thanks for watching and good luck.